Why do you have a chin? It's probably not a question you've ever asked yourself. I'm sure some people just don't care. But it's part of who I am. I'm not me without a chin. You're not you without a chin. And I think that's plenty of motivation to seek an answer. After all, asking questions about human evolution is essentially asking about what makes you, you. But it's not just you and me that are at stake here. It's our entire species. So the quest to find the holy chin is really important. See, there's one odd thing about a chin. We all have one, but literally no other species does. Well, except for elephants, but they have a trunk and their face is all trunky. It's different. But more importantly, nothing that we call pre-human has one. No Australopithecines, no Homo erectus, not even Neanderthals, or any other human-like species that was around at the same time we were. Nada. Zip. Zilch. Zero. And that's amazing, because it could mean at the dawn of Homo sapiens, before we left Africa, something favored the evolution of a chin. That hasn't left us since. I had to drop that bomb first. Hopefully I got you hooked. But I need to discuss one major point before we continue on our quest to find the holy chin. What exactly is a chin? Sounds obvious, it's that thing at the bottom of your jaw, right? Well, yeah, but if we're on a quest, we need to know exactly what we're looking for. In this case, what really matters is the upside down T-shape of bone on your lower jaw. This feature is known as the mental trigon, but we don't see it in pre-humans. This is Turcanaboy. He's a homo ergaster who lived roughly 1.5 million years ago. And as you can see, there's no upside down T. It's completely flat with no features whatsoever. I could show you more examples, but beating dead horses really isn't my thing. So let's get this quest started. Like any other, we're gonna have to overcome a bunch of obstacles before we get to the end. But first, we need a sword. Luckily, the paleoanthropologist Jeffrey Schwartz and Ian Tattersall have forged just a pretty good one. I feel ridiculous holding this sword. I mean, I'd swing it for dramatic effect, but I'd probably break something. In their paper, The Human Chin Revisited, they put forth a very convincing argument that the mental trigon is a feature distinct from the rest of the jaw that likely came about in its current form all at once. Now that's a little tricky to understand, so let me give you a hypothetical example. All humans have flat foreheads. But what if someone was born with a forehead that looked like a Klingon's? How could that be possible? The answer would likely lie in regulatory genes, some of which determine where bone is deposited. We don't have a great understanding of regulatory genes, me least of all. But a mutation in one of these genes can lead to new features appearing seemingly out of thin air. With regards to the mental trigon, we're led to this conclusion because its shape is very distinct, yet there's no evidence to suggest that it evolved over a long period of time. Unfortunately, like any magic sword, you're not sure how to use it until you do. Trust me, you'll see where I'm going with this. So we've honed in on our goal, we've got our sword, and now it's time to slay a monster. Famous paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould. I like this guy a lot, so it sucks that we have to fight, but he briefly argued that the mental trigon was a spandrel. A spandrel is a term he borrowed from architecture that essentially translates to a feature whose appearance is a result of the evolution of adjacent features. He believed that our chin's existence was a byproduct for a lengthy evolution that selected for smaller and smaller jaws. Luckily, we have our magic sword. The chin couldn't have developed alongside the reduction of jaw size. It just popped up. Popped up, that's the technical term, right? Anyway, the spandrel theory isn't compatible with how we understand the origins of the human chin. Our sword beats Stephen J. Gould, and our quest continues. Next, we encounter the siren, and it's a luring song of the sexual selection theory. We like the look of a nice chin. So the theory, I mean siren, argues that chin shape was a strong enough factor back in the day in Africa that it remains today as a sexy cosmetic feature. Much of the evidence that supports this theory relies on the argument that hormone levels can have an impact on the prominence of the chin. So if you've got a lot of testosterone, bigger chin. A lot of estrogen, smaller chin. The jury's still out on that one, but it doesn't even matter. These hormone levels only appear to affect the soft tissue of the chin. There doesn't appear to be any difference between the sexes and the chin's bone structure, and that's what counts. These sirens want you to forget the true name of the chin, the mental trigon. We're done here. Moving on. Now we're faced with two theories. I mean, sphinxes. They're totally okay with the idea that the mental trigon just popped up. Our sword's powerless here. But instead of giving us riddles, they give us the best scientific information currently available on the topic. These are like academic sphinxes or something. The first sphinx says that she's looked at the strain of the lower jaw from chewing. The mental trigon might have served as an adaptation to buttress the jaw against these stresses. The chewing theory still requires a lot of science to be done, though. We've gotten conflicting results in doing the same type of analysis. We can't accept it as truth, but we can't throw it out just yet. The second sphinx says that he has looked at the strain in the lower jaw caused by talking. He found that the area of most strain is exactly where the mental trigon is. This is where the muscle that controls your bottom lip attaches. But not only that, the use of your tongue also puts strain in this part of your jaw. And as you can see, as I talk, my bottom lip and tongue are moving constantly. This is very different from the ooh, 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 and ah, ah, ah that we attribute to primates. It's a frequency of use that puts stress in this part of the bone. And when we put stress on bone, just like muscle, it responds and becomes thicker. So what we're looking at is a mutation 
causes the mental trigon, which puts more bone exactly where we need it. And that could certainly be advantageous. Speech theory is a really elegant explanation for the function of the mental trigon. It makes sense. We have evidence to support it. But we haven't really been setting the chin for that long. We still have more to learn. And while we should lean towards speech theory for now, we shouldn't be opposed to considering alternative explanations. And I know, that's not satisfying to some people. They want to hear about a hero who takes on a quest and unambiguously finishes it. But that's a fantasy. And this is how it is sometimes. The Holy Chin is out there. We might have found it. But the quest isn't over until we're sure. As you can tell, I love Chin, so if you have any questions or comments, feel free to comment here. Or email me. Or you can tweet it. But I'm not even done telling you the epic of the human chin. In my next video, I'm going to talk about how speech theory challenges our perceptions of human origins and might also change the way that we understand the speech capabilities of Neanderthals. The chin could be a major player in our battle to understand the origins of human speech. It's a big deal. So subscribe and you'll see me again next week. You might just learn something.